morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me as director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute to welcome all of you to our conference today. This is a very welcome and auspicious day for both the Schumann Center and the European University Institute. It is the fulfillment of an ambition that began over four years ago. We have developed a very strong collaboration with the Japanese Foreign Ministry in Rome uh, and also with Professor Ken Endo from Hokkaido University. Uh, and we began to think about uh, the institutionalization of a, of a project or program on EU-Asia, EU-Japan relations at the European University Institute. And we were motivated to do so by the landmark uh, EU-Japan strategic partnership, which was launched or agreed in July 2018 by the then Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Commission Presidents Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk. This was a major landmark development in relations between Japan and the EU, and we felt that this was something that the European University Institute should mark, but also begin a research project, a project on. Uh, and we began uh, with a number of workshops beginning in November 2018, but we wanted to institutionalize this relationship. We wanted to institutionalize and give capacity to our work in this field. And uh, particularly in terms of our landmark and flagship program, the Global Governance Program. So it is a great opportunity we now have because over the next two days, we launch an EU Asia project, which has been supported by the Japan Foundation. Uh, and for the EUI, uh, this is an important strategic development because at the EUI, our convention gives us a European mission, but increasingly in the 21st century, a European mission must be encased within a, an analysis of Europe in the wider global system. It is not possible to have a European uh, mission today without in fact, uh, including in that a, a very serious analysis of the world beyond. And increasingly at the Schumann Center, we seek to address major policy challenges across uh, and themes, but with adequate attention to geography. Uh, and as Mackinder, the uh, father of geopolitics said, geography can be described as the mother of strategy. Or History is simply geography stretched over time. So geography, the, the expansion of our area-based focus is really important to the uh, European University Institute and to the Robert Schumann Center. So the EU Asia project is very significant in and of itself because relations between the EU Asia Japan, uh, it, given that we are a part of that club of democracies in a world where with an authoritarian turn. Uh, but it's also important to us in terms of expanding our area based focus and the world beyond Europe. And clearly, the uh, focus of this conference, the EU, Japan and a fraying international order, certainly uh, is uh, the subject matter of our conference, certainly uh, looks at, addresses and analyzes the key questions concerning the shifting of geopolitics of the 21st century. Geopolitics has been ever present in our world, in a world of power. But increasingly, uh, we are at a time of both shift and shock, a time when history is pivoting, when we see uh, new, uh, when we see fundamental changes in terms of our global order, uh, at a time with lots of uh, the, the international system is churning in many, many different ways. And we, I think, only know with certainty two things about that international order. One, it will be multipolar. It is multipolar. And secondly, it is increasingly characterized by great power competition. We don't know how that competition will be directed, contained or 
whether we face rupture. And we don't know what uh, the future of all those multilateral institutions that were established in the post Second World War international order, what future they have, because one could have a world of multipolarity and great power competition without the constraint, without the constraints of adequate multilateralism. And of course, both for the EU and for Japan, multilateralism is in the DNA. It is what uh, it is how uh, these two parts of the world position themselves uh, in the international uh, in the international system. So I am as outgoing director of the Robert Schuman Center. I am very pleased that it, during my mandate that we have managed to institutionalize our relations with Japan and that we are today launching the EU Asia project. Uh, the EU Asia project, the two scientific uh, coordinators of this project are uh, Professor Ken Ender from Hokkaido University, who's been both associated with the EUI for a very long time, but also intrinsic to this project from the beginning, and Dr. Julia Pugliese, who will, uh, who has joined us. He is both at Oxford, but also at the European University Institute, and he will direct the project. And we look forward very much to further events to research, there will be a teaching component of the project, uh, but it really is a very exciting day for us at, uh, at the Robert Schuman Center and the European University Institute. Uh, I would like to thank, before we begin the formal proceedings, I would like to thank very much the Japan Foundation for their uh, financial support for this project. Without them, it would simply not be possible. And we look forward very much to working with the Japan Foundation uh, over the next years. I also want to thank the scientific coordinators, Ken Endo and Yulia Pugliese, again, without whom we would not have this project. And to all of you, the speakers, the discussants and the attendants at our conference, and of course, the staff of the Schumann Center, uh, who uh, have managed to transit to transit from the world of face to face to the world of remote to enable us to continue uh, with our activities, despite all of the constraints, uh, all of the constraints we face. And now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Enrica Letta. I can't think of anyone more suited to launch our project this morning. Dr. Letta, former Prime Minister of Italy, and until last week, Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po. He has returned to Italian politics as leader of the Partito Democratico, and we wish him well in his, uh, in, in his return. Uh, and he continues as president of APSIA, the uh, network of professional schools of international affairs, and of president of the Jacques Delors Institute, that premier think tank that both honors Jacques Delors, but also looks to a Europe that Jacques Delors would be proud of. So it is a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Enrique Letta and to give him the floor for the opening keynote. We're very indebted to you for your time this morning. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me uh, being here today with all of you. As you said very warmly, I uh, accepted this invitation when I was in, a, in another life uh, some two months ago, and I decided to uh, keep uh, the possibility of being with you today. Uh, first of all, because of all of you, uh, because of uh, the importance uh, of this project, and because of the subject. I strongly believe that relationship between uh, the European Union, Asia, and relationships between European Union and Japan are decisive for the future. And I think the cooperation uh, among uh, academic centers, universities, uh, like the one you are experiencing here, and I take the opportunity to say uh, hello and to warmly congratulate uh, Professor Giulio Pugliese, Professor Ken Endo, uh, Hokkaido University, uh, the Fiesole Institute, uh, uh, and of course, um, also Japan Foundation for uh, this, the organization of this very interesting event. Uh, why I think 
it is so important today to work in that direction. Uh, there are many reasons. I will be uh, very short in uh, underlining uh, for me the most important reasons. First of all, it is very timely today, uh, this event and talking uh, around these topics, because this year, uh, 2021st, is a year where maybe, maybe we are at the beginning of a new multilateralism era. And I say that uh, for, uh, there are many reasons. First of all, the pandemia. Pandemia uh, obliged all of us to think that interdependence is strongly at the very core of all what we are doing. Multilateralism is necessary. Uh, I launched at uh, OECD uh, a level a proposal some, some uh, weeks ago. The proposal is the creation of an index, an international index of the cost of non-cooperation. Why this index? Because I think pandemia showed very clearly that uh, being alone, uh, without cooperation, without multilateral cooperation, without international cooperation, costs a lot in terms of lives, first of all, uh, in terms of uh, economic resources, loss of resources. And I think having uh, such an index uh, can help all the international institutions and uh, leadership, states, non-state actors uh, to think how important is uh, strengthening uh, the international cooperation and multilateralism. And I think pandemia is the first reason. It is not only the first reason, there are many other reasons, but I think we all understood how important today uh, rebuilding confidence in a multilateral system and it is an interesting year for many reasons. I am Italian and uh, Italy will lead the G20 this year. And G20 will be one of the boost of multilateralism. And I always remind that uh, uh, G20 in uh, the last important G20 that took place in 19, uh, the Osaka uh, uh, summit was a big push and big uh, boost of, multilateralism on, on some important subjects. So um, I think there's a link between Japanese G2019, uh, Italian G20 this year, uh, the relaunch of multilateralism. Uh, this year will be the year of COP26 in Glasgow. I think it is another main topic, WTO with a new leader, uh, Ngozi Okonjo, uh, first woman, first leader coming from Africa at the WTO. There are many reasons to think that uh, multilateralism is back. And I think these reasons are very important and we have to work uh, strengthening uh, multilateralism. The second main topic is about uh, bilateral relationships, uh, EU, Japan. It is clear that the world uh, is more and more focused in geopolitical terms, in economic terms, in technological terms is around a new polarization, a bipolarization uh, between the US and China. And this bipolarization, uh, I think it is not a good news for the world. It is good where there's competition in terms of having more innovation, uh, more new rules, more new uh, ideas, that's positive. Uh, but in the last years and in the last period, I think this competition uh, uh, turned bad, I think, in, a, in, a, in the direction of uh, uh, something that was close to a sort of uh, a Cold War, a new Cold War. And I think there are two parts of the world uh, which uh, have a strong responsibility because of the past, because of their size, because of their strength to avoid. Uh, this bad scenario. And these two parts of the world with this responsibility are European Union and Japan. It is not by chance that we, together with the US, we are, and, and Canada, of course, we are the pillars of G7. And I think in this very period, G7 can be uh, a new protagonist 
of the geopolitical discussion and the geopolitical order. Uh, because frankly speaking, and those, I don't see any other places where Japan, Europe, and North America can discuss, share positions about the most important topics at world level. And one of them is the relationship with China. I think it is impossible for, in a bilateral way for Europe or for Japan or for US to have just the idea of a bilateral relationship with China. I think we have to share our position. It is clear that China uh, will be in the next decade the number one at world level uh, in terms of uh, economic power. And I think it is clear that uh, there are many subjects where uh, Japan, uh, European Union and US, uh, we have to uh, share positions. And I think the G7 can be one of them, but that can work only if Europe and Japan can suggest, can uh, uh, push the US to have a multilateral approach to China. I think the first move uh, of um, President Biden was good, it was not the idea just to have a sort of confrontation, continuous confrontation with China without any talk with uh, allies like uh, Europe and Japan. I think there's room for a more interesting cooperation among us. And I think Japan and European Union, we have, and we have to take the lead uh, of this uh, strategy. My last, very last point is about technology. And I underline the fact that on technology, I think uh, we have to strengthen and to focus the relationship between the European Union and Japan. Why on technology? I come back to the Osaka uh, G20 summit uh, because the uh, G20 Japan leadership was the first signal at world level out of Europe of the need to have a sort of uh, technological humanism approach, if I may say. Technology, it is not only uh, new innovations, new discovery, it is not only an evolution in technological terms. I think we have a step where it is absolutely needed and necessary to have in mind the fact that the future of uh, technological innovation is the relationship with human being, the relationship with human values. Uh, when we uh, discuss uh, artificial intelligence, when we discuss data protection, I underline this point, data protection. Data protection is a is a topic where it is clear that uh, Japan and the European Union, we can have an approach that is very, very close. The approach to say the human being, person at the center and market on the one hand and state on the other hand, they have to be in a second stage. They have to be uh, behind the centrality of the human being and the person. And it is not just rhetoric. What I'm saying has consequences in terms of economic choices, in terms of law choices, legal approaches. Uh, and I remember uh, the, the Osaka summit was the first moment at multilateral level when I heard uh, these words. Italy today is leading the uh, G20 with the same ideas and the European Union, as you know, has the topic of technological humanism as one of the most important challenges. And the European Commission under the leadership of Margaret Vestager on these topics, uh, vice president of the commission uh, in charge for these topics is uh, strongly uh, working in that direction. So I put this topic on the table, I focus uh, this topic because I think that can be one of the most important part of this uh, very strong uh, multilateral and uh, bilateral EU-Japan cooperation. So I stop here. I thank you so much for the invitation and I, I will be more than happy to listen and to uh, read the outcome uh, of this uh, very important symposium because I strongly believe that this topic will be decisive for the future. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Letta, and thank you for framing our conference in such a such an, a significant way. And what I draw, apart from your emphasis on technological humanism, which is a very interesting way of framing our technological challenges, is your reminder to us that we are at a period where there is the multilateral opportunity. In other words, there now is an opportunity to, to frame that great power competition and to frame it within a, a multilateral order. Because without multilateralism, then we will have that great power competition will get out of control. So I think it's very useful for us uh, for this conference to keep in mind what are the uh, avenues and instruments and what needs to be done to deliver on uh, 21st century multilateralism. And I agree with you that the signs are auspicious for all of the reasons that you uh, for all of the reasons that you outlined. And we now we now move to a, a video, a recorded welcome from uh, the Japanese Foreign Minister, Mr. Toshimitsu Motegi, a very long and distinguished career in uh, office in Japan and uh, Japanese foreign ministers uh, since September 2019. So we now have a recorded welcome. Oshu Daigakuin Daigaku Shisai no Seminar. The EU, Japan, and the Framing International Order no Kaisai. Mata, Gendai Nihon Kanren Koza no Kaisetsu o Kokoro Kara.関係しますインド太平洋は世界の成長センターですこのインド太平洋地域で法の視野に基づく自由で開かれた秩序を構築することは地域社会ひいては世界の平和と繁栄につながりますインド太平洋に関する議論が開始されています。本年1月私は日本の外務大臣として初めてEUが外務理事会に出席し、自由で開かれたインド太平洋の実現に向けた連携、協力を深めることで一致しました。今後、日本とEUの間で地域の連結性
with a special emphasis on Asia. I am very glad that the Japan Foundation, the only public entity in Japan that specializes in international cultural exchanges, can take part in the launch of the EU Asia program, the very first of its kind at the EUI dedicated to EU Asia relations. We take pride in supporting the first two academic posts at the EU Asia program, which have been taken by two of the leading scholars in the field today. Professor Endo Ken, a specialist of EU Japan relations, and Dr. Giulio Pugliese, an Asian security specialist with strong ties with Japan, who is also a Japan Foundation Fellow alumnus. I very much hope that the various endeavors under the EU Asia program will contribute to a deeper understanding of the challenges that we are faced with and inform the public of possible avenues of coordination and cooperation between Japan and the EU, which will address these challenges. I also expect that the EU Asia program will further strengthen and widen the network of experts in this field. The impressive list of keynote speakers and participants for the workshop is the testament to the level of interest shown in this important project, and I am thankful to all the participants who have gathered here to share their knowledge and insights. My sincere gratitude goes out to all the staff concerned who have worked tirelessly in miraculously putting this event together with such limited time for preparations. I'm confident of not only the outcome of the workshop, but that the process of exchanges itself will contribute to the furtherance of the relationship between Japan and the EU. Finally, on a personal note, I would like to add that it is a particular joy for me as a former Japanese ambassador to Italy to witness a new partnership between the JF and the EUI. As I have fond memories of the city of Firenze and its environs, I very much hope that I can have the pleasure of visiting the EUI in the future when circumstances allow. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Bridget, it's you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. We had two recorded speakers. The second speaker was Mr. Kazuyoshi Umemoto, uh, president of the Japan Foundation, our funders for uh, this project. We reconvene in 15 minutes, but let me take this opportunity again to thank Dr. Enrico Letta for his uh, contribution this morning, for his presence this morning, and for framing so uh, so carefully uh, the sorts of issues that we face. Thank you, Dr. Letta. Thank you, uh, our participants and our viewers on YouTube. And we reconvene in 15 minutes. But we can now officially say that the EU Asia project is launched at the European University Institute. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the EUI Asia Project Mega Conference. This is a sort of launching event, and I am very happy to chair this um, uh, privileged uh, in a session. Uh, Europe faces Asia. Asia faces Europe. Now we are supposed to uh, talk on the Europe's engagement in Asia and the EU Japan Euro Japan cooperations. Now, um, my name is Ken Endo, a professor at the Hokkaido University, as well as part-time professor at the European University Institute. So I'd like to say uh, in a good morning to European colleagues and the good evening to the Japanese audience. Now, today, um, we are quite honored to have uh, four speakers um, uh, from uh, both sides of the Europe. Eurasia. The um, first, uh, Na uh, Madame Natalie Totti, the director of the uh, Institute of International Affairs in Rome. And second speaker is uh, Reinhard uh, Butkofer, the member of the European Parliament. Uh, and the third speaker is uh, Professor uh, Shinichi Kitaoka, the president of the Japan uh, International Cooperation Agency, uh, as well as a professor at the uh, University of Tokyo. Now, the final speaker is Dr. Anna Costa, the now currently working at the Italian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and she's a specialist of Chinese politics and foreign affairs. Now, uh, this is the first real session discussing in depth the uh, the the subject matters of this uh, mega conference, well, you know, the uh, which is uh, 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 that has the has a background, the uh, some themes like, uh, you know, as uh, uh, President Letter in the uh, welcoming session uh, stated clearly, we have the needs uh, increased increasingly the needs for the international and multilateral cooperation. And then these needs are real, uh, given the, you know, the COVID and, and, and other issues. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, we have a less charitable uh, international environment. First, we have a less dependable United States, uh, despite the incoming of the, uh, uh, the new president. Uh, we also have the rise of the not so peaceful and more authoritarian China. And we have geopolitical, geoeconomic, geotechnological competition, uh, and especially the US China uh, hegemonic rivalries. Um, so we are supposed to discuss these trends and issues uh, with some emphasis. Uh, on the Indo-Pacific uh, area, uh, region, uh, geographically, and also thematically US-China, Euro-Japan, with some accents upon the strategic communications and disinformation, geoeconomics, economic statecrafts, and technological competition, too. Um, I think these themes are all familiar for uh, most of you. Uh, but we would like to have uh, the, their own views on all of these uh, issues or some of these issues. Um, uh, and, and the speakers can choose uh, at their own will uh, uh, according to the importance and so on. But anyway, uh, given these backgrounds, um, uh, in the end, we are uh, uh, going to discuss the potentials and constraints uh, that the EU, uh, Euro-Japan cooperation may have. Okay, uh, for the introduction, I think it's, it's vast enough. And the, uh, um, the may I ask um, Dr. Natori Tocci uh, to uh, uh, open the debate. Uh, the, uh, could you have the 10 minutes uh, presentation from your own side? Well, thank you so much, and um, thank you Grazie. again. It's a real pleasure to uh, be with, uh, with with you, and in fact, with with all of you uh, at at TUI, which uh, I also consider, uh, in part, to be one of my alma maters. 
Um, so before I, I get to the specifics, in fact, I won't really get to the specifics of uh, EU-Japan relations because there are people far more competent than I am to sp speak about the, the details of this. But I thought what might be uh, interesting would be to sort of give uh, a, a sort of broader overview of how the EU's role in uh, the sort of in, in, in the, the sort of broad framework of global norm setting has changed, and as a consequence, how this uh, has affected will affect um, the relationship between Europe and Asia in general, and Europe and Japan in in particular. So I would start off by saying that the external identity uh, of the European Union has always been very much embedded upon this notion of norm setting. Uh, the sort of a big chunk of the literature on European foreign policy, particularly if we think about uh, the literature from the late 1990s throughout the uh, 2000s, uh, the first decade of the 2000s was really very much premised on this idea that uh, the European Union was a normative power. And by normative power was, was essentially meant was the ability of the European Union to shape the global conception of the normal. Uh, so this idea of uh, standard setting, of norm setting, which then took different uh, sort of shapes and forms at times, as I said, the EU was considered as a normative power, particularly if one uh, thought about uh, normative areas in the domains of uh, human rights or, or climate. At times, it was translated into the idea of the EU as a regulatory power, particularly if one thought about uh, the uh, sort of trade and economic uh, sort of domains, as well as increasingly also uh, data privacy uh, aspects. But, but basically this idea that uh, the EU, because of the very uh, way in which it was constituted internally, uh, had at, at its essence, uh, at its external essence or identity, the idea of uh, shaping uh, global norms and, and standards. Now, that conception of the EU's global role was very much premised upon what in shorthand, we tend to refer to as the international liberal order. So uh, the idea basically that here was the EU, which in its broadly civilian uh, way, uh, shaped global norms and standards because it was operating within a broader global system, which was essentially premised upon the hard power uh, of uh, the United States, and in which more broadly, I would say, and of course, the two cannot be uh, uh, disentangled, more broadly, there was a sense that history was moving in one direction. In fact, history had ended. Huh? Uh, and, and by ending, what was um, sort of meant was not necessarily that history had reached the end of its contradictions, but in, in a sense, in a sort of Hegelian way, uh, those contradictions uh, were, were embedded within uh, the idea that liberal democracy was uh, if you like, the only possible way forward, uh, uh, and that contradictions played out, in a sense, uh, within the confines uh, of, uh, of liberal democracies. Now, in a sense, that world, which was a wonderful world uh, for, for Europeans and for Japanese, <laughs> has gone. Uh, and, and, and I think now we are living through uh, an era in which we know that um, we are going to be, you know, sort of struggling with and coexisting with a very different distribution of power globally, uh, in which at the end of the day, there will be, and there are already multiple power centers, and in which those different, you know, those multiple power centers, which will uh, conflict at times, cooperate at other times, but will necessarily have to coexist, are at the end of the day going to be broadly uh, drawn uh, to, to two different poles, to do two different poles which represent uh, two different political and ideological uh, uh, models of the uh, sort of better way uh, to, to deliver to citizens. And, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, again, simplifying here enormously, but there is going to be 
beyond the uh, the trade and the digital and the security and the, you know all the different aspects in which conflictuality is going to play out there is going to be this broader political and ideological confrontation which at the end of the day does pit liberal democracies uh, on the one hand and however else one may want to call them illiberal authoritarian autocratic i mean you know take your pick but i think we all know what we're talking about uh, powers on the other hand in which uh, one obviously inevitably draws towards the United States, which does not mean to say that as Europeans or as Japanese, we, we, we will be agreeing with the United States uh, on each and every issue. And of course, certainly uh, as Europeans, and I'll leave it up to Japanese to what extent this is also true for Japan, there is going to be the striving for a degree of autonomy in order to make sure that we, we are the ones deciding when we agree and when we don't agree, and there is not, nothing sort of preordained about this, but inevitably that is going to be our direction of travel. In the same way as there is going to be a different uh, poll, which is inevitably going to revolve around uh, China, which beyond, as I said, the different trade and security and digital and energy and whatever uh, forms of dispute and, and conflict is also going to be represented by a different uh, model of, of governance. And in many respects, I think if one is to sort of make the comparison, which is always wrong to make, but I will make it nonetheless, to the Cold War period, in many respects, that political and ideological confrontation is going to be a much harsher one than it was during the Cold War. Because let's face it, um, in the case of the Cold War, where obviously there was a real uh, confrontation, particularly in obviously the nuclear sphere, but with the perhaps exception of the first decade or so uh, of the Cold War, there was never really an argument as to which was the system, which was the governance system, which delivered uh, better to its citizens. In this case, there is going to be, I mean, the debate is going to be uh, far more acute uh, because it is not at all clear which is going to be the system that delivers more prosperity for more people uh, uh, if one makes the comparison between liberal democracies and, and authoritarian systems. Um, now, I, I say all this in order to go back to this issue of uh, Europe as a norm setter and to simply uh, sort of posit this, I mean, sort of, you know, sort of paint this context to make the argument that although uh, Europeans and then the European Union in particular will continue to be and strive to be a global norm setter, inevitably the way in which they do it will have to change because it will no longer be norm setting within the confines of the international liberal order that what I was uh, depicting earlier. Um, and, and what I mean by this is that it is going to be a, no, a global uh, norm setting uh, sort of uh, exercise, if you like, that will be conducted within a broader global context in which normative contestation is going to be far more acute, in which it will be um, far more difficult to make the case in a very clear cut way that these are the norms that better deliver. To citizens, because as I said, that contestation is going to be far more acute than it was certainly during the era of the international liberal order and arguably also uh, during the Cold War. So all this brings me to the EU-Asia uh, relationship and in particular the EU-Japan relationship, because if it is true that that normative contestation is going to be far more acute than it was in the past, then it's far, and, and therefore the, the EU's role as a global norm setter will inevitably have to change, then it is clear that it will have to change by putting far greater emphasis than was the case in the past to the idea of uh, partnering and partnerships. Uh, and here is where obviously the relationship with uh, Japan comes in in a very forceful way. And I think it's sort of, you know, in, in the broader debate of, well, how do we go about uh, strengthening multilateralism in this uh, sort of context of, you know, how do we uh, continue to be effective as a global norm setter? I think it's useful both for the EU and Japan in their partnering to try and figure out which are the policy areas uh, in which, let me put it this way, quantity trumps quality, 
and which are the policy areas in which the reverse is true. And what I mean by this is, which are the policy areas where in order to deliver global public goods, um, it is more important to cast the net as wide as possible, meaning to include as many countries as possible, even when there isn't a shared normative basis, and which are the areas instead in which it is actually more important to really share the same values more than casting, as I said, the net as wide as possible. And I think broadly speaking, and I really end on this because I've realized I've gone past my 10 minutes, you know, I, I think one can look at areas like climate, like pandemics, like non-proliferation, to pick three obvious cases, where quantity trumps quality, uh, and areas like obviously human rights, international humanitarian law, I would argue digital, uh, migration, I mean, you know, everything where the nexus with individual rights is far more, more prominent, if you like, where quality trumps quantity, where, the, where, where sort of working together as liberal democracies and perhaps only as liberal democracies is more important than casting the net as wide as possible. And I would say that everything that falls into the economic basket is somewhere in between. And I say all this because depending on these two uh, sort of sets of policy areas, the strategy somehow changes. As I said, very obviously in the case in which quality trumps quantity, it's a question of working together and um, in a sense only working together huh? because it is very difficult to try and actually get any agreement when there is such a, um, a lack of a shared normative basis with, uh, with respect to others. And then there will obviously be other, I mean, and, and, and the, the attempt here will be that of creating a critical mass in order to then make the argument vis-a-vis -vis those uh, 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 that, that do not share those same values. Uh, as opposed to areas, as I said, where uh, quantity uh, uh, trumps quality, where it is a question of, you know, sort of casting the net as wide as possible and respectively using the different relationships that we may have with countries like China or Russia uh, to try and bring them into the extent uh, possible. As I said, I've probably spoken far too much, Ken, so I'll give the floor back to you. Natalie, thank you very much indeed for the excellent uh, intervention uh, at the beginning. This is a wonderful introduction and you started from the EU's uh, normal, norm setting identity. But uh, the, one of the points that I find quite intriguing is that your, is your observation. I think it's quite right the, that the uh, new types of this regime competitions may be more acute and severe than the, the age of the Cold War, perhaps, because you know nobody knows which which regime regime brings about prosperity and and, and perhaps control of of, of the uh, COVID. Now, um, you might have suggested perhaps at the at the end the, the, the sort of this the need to distinguish the strategy, uh, you know, you know, to target how to say it is sort of distinguish between the loose multilateralism and tight multilateralism, if I may paraphrase, <laughs> targeting at the greater number of the cooperative countries, uh, climate change, perhaps inclusive of China. But the, uh, on the other hand, in terms of uh, quality, uh, high quality type of multilateralism, focusing on human rights and so on. Uh, you, you, you may correct if I, if I may be uh, wrong, but uh, uh, it, it sounded like that. But thank you very much indeed for your wonderful uh, uh, kickstart speech. Now, uh, may we shift to uh, Dr. Reinhard uh, uh, Buttikofer, an old friend of mine as well, the member of the European Parliament, quite uh, strong, uh, 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 the critique of the, uh, the, um, the German as well, as well as perhaps the EU's policy toward China these days. Uh, so, uh, Reinhardt, could you take the floor, please? Thank you very much, Professor Endo, for including me in this program. I uh, do not have a doctorate. I didn't even finish my studies at university. I became a politician before I could. Um, but um, 
I'm, I'm glad to contribute a little bit uh, looking at uh, how the EU positions itself in the context of the recently uh, negotiated comprehensive agreement on investment between the EU and China. Um, as everybody knows, that was done just uh, two days before the end of the year and before the end of the German presidency. And without doubt, it was done under heavy pressure from the German chancellor in particular. Now, when I look at the reactions from the business community, as far as I can see, they are basically favorable, but lacking any enthusiasm. I would describe reactions at, as lukewarm at best. And privately, I have heard very critical evaluations from leaders from the business community. On the other hand, political reactions have been much more divided. And in the European Parliament in particular, there's a lot of criticism. Now, why is the business community less than enthusiastic? I think there are quite a number of very uh, interesting reasons for that. Um, I would sum it up by saying uh, the deal does not achieve what had been the European goal. It does not achieve a level playing field. There is no common investment protection scheme that's continuing um, as a negotiation topic. There is no progress on public procurement. There is no competitive neutrality. Reciprocity is uh, only um, in very uh, few exceptional uh, um, uh, areas. There is a, an extremely sweeping national security exemption. The, the deal doesn't uh, look at uh, the impact of corporate social credit systems in China. Uh, it doesn't really deal with localization imperatives. It doesn't uh, deal with uh, increasing CCP interference with the private sector. All of that is seen as a disappointment. Still, there is, as I said, um, a favorable um, attitude and that uh, relies mostly on the market access promises that uh, the deal holds. I've spoken to representatives of major corporations that have all um, in a way expressed a similar attitude. They, they're, they're saying, well, this is not ideal, but it's better than nothing. And for us, as we're dependent on access to the Chinese market, uh, that is something not to be ignored. Now, in the political realm, there is a dimension uh, of the conversation that's not necessarily reflected that much in the business community. And this is the geopolitical implications of the deal. Does this deal that had been negotiated for seven years, that means that was started at a time when we still defined China as a strategic partner, does that deal really reflect the new attitude of uh, seeing China as a systemic rival and a competitor and maybe also a partner, but much less so than in the past? Doesn't the timing of the deal just three weeks before uh, the inauguration of President Biden um, help um, Xi Jinping to uh, uh, show uh, the new Biden administration kind of the, the political equivalent of a middle finger saying, uh, Europe's are more eager to deal with us than they are to team up with you. Isn't the deal a signal that, to put it in the words of Angela Merkel, 
uh, Europeans are reluctant to form a camp in the global um, competition between democracies and authoritarian regimes together with the United States. And does the deal really sort of reflect the reality that um, as China is less beholden to uh, international norms, if we want to make a deal stick, we would have to rely on effective enforcement mechanisms. These are, I think, pertinent political questions. Now, we're not questioning that there are some positive elements uh, with regard to market access, but many of them come with strings attached. They are counteracted by other government measures in China, and they're not equally favorable to multinational corporations and uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. It may be a bit overblown if somebody um, from Harvard just recently said that the whole deal is just a bonanza for 20 to 30 um, major European multinationals, half of which are from Germany. But uh, I would indeed say that this is a better deal for Volkswagen than, there, than it is for the um, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in the automotive sector. Uh, this is reflected in a particular provision in the deal that does open the door for investment in new energy vehicles if you can afford investing above 1 billion. But if you are not, then uh, the opening is much more conditional and much more limited and comes with strings attached. So this could effectively play into uh, China's uh, dual circulation strategy that wants to lure big international uh, investors while forcing them to localize. And um, that could have very detrimental uh, industrial policy consequences uh, for the European industry. Then there is criticism also with regard to level playing field issues where the conflict resolution mechanism in case there is a conflict is pretty weak. And particularly we uh, have had uh, a lot of criticism with regard to the sustainability side of the deal where the pledges that China makes uh, on climate are way be behind the curve. Uh, that has been negotiated maybe three years ago and it doesn't reflect uh, the newer developments, but we're particularly uh, angered by the uh, wording in the deal on um, um, uh, labor protections, in particular ILO conventions against forced labor, where China just commits to hot air and no real action. So the European Parliament cannot be assumed to, um, um, to, to end up supporting the deal uh, in the end, maybe, uh, 10 months from now or whenever it, it would have to be um, decided upon. And on, on the other hand, we're trying to play a proactive uh, role also and to, to try to, to uh, move commission and member states to take a new approach with regard to norm setting. If this deal is too weak with regard to norm setting, maybe we should emphasize more our autonomous measures. And this is what uh, groups in the European Parliament have been telling commission and member states. There would be opportunities for us through autonomous measures to address some of the issues that the deal doesn't uh, address, like banning the importation of products of forced labor into the European market. Uh, putting in place a human rights due diligence mechanism, putting in place the international procurement instrument to uh, um, go for reciprocity in that market, uh, like um, um, enacting anti-subsidy measures on the basis of the white paper that the commission published June last year, um, 
or um, Im improve our investment screening mechanism, or finally come up with the anti-coercion instrument that the commission promised, which they call the bazooka against economic coercion of the type that we see in the case of Australia at the moment. If European Commission and member states would move on these fronts, I think that would change the conversation. And obviously, we also demand from the Chinese side to ratify pertinent um, ILO core conventions. The battle is uh, still undecided. If the vote in the European Parliament about the deal would be tomorrow, I would assume there could be between 300 and 400 votes opposed. Uh, that might be enough to, to ditch the deal. So uh, I think this is a very interesting example of the, the repositioning of the European Union, where this, this investment deal is a hangover from an earlier period, and we now try to deal with it in a new phase of the EU-China relation. Reinhard, thank you very much indeed again uh, for this uh, uh, powerful argument. Uh, you focus on this uh, CAI, the a comprehensive agreement on the investment between uh, EU and China. And by doing that, you, uh, you shed light on the so many issues, uh, starting from human rights, reciprocity, enforcement mechanism, private sectors problem, uh, and the sustainability uh, and, and so on. And the, uh, perhaps this is the moment for the real politics as well. Uh, because the uh, ratification of this agreement um, uh, is still subject to the European Parliament approval, and the uh, um, and your your critique on this um, uh, agreement um, uh, is still uh, the um, influence in this the course of the event, perhaps, and perhaps the uh, in the wider sense uh, you touched upon this. Um, fundamental problem perhaps that we face uh, that is that the you know you know uh, china is a, is a huge market and and uh, we are talking about this market access at uh, which cost uh, and you know this is there is something to barter um, uh, in exchange for this market access and then we Japan also has uh, just concluded the uh, RCEP agreement uh, uh, with uh, other Asian nations, uh, obviously including China. So perhaps we touch upon this uh, issue later on. Thank you. Now, um, uh, we now turn to Professor, uh, Pro President Shinichi Kitaoka, uh, President of JICA. Please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Endo, uh, for your very kind introduction. Let me start with uh, my finding of a change of Chinese policy. Uh, I, can, I can tell when Chinese policy began to change. It's uh, 2008. I was then uh, a chairman of the Japanese team in Japan-China Joint Study of History, which was started in December 2006. At that time, there was some flexibility. We can exchange our views relatively freely. But uh, uh, when Fu Chintao came to Japan, made a visit to Fukuda, Prime Minister Fukuda, and then there was a good agreement. But uh, uh, some people, hawkish people, or hawks, uh, considered that uh, Fu Chintao made uh, too much concession, compromise to Fukuda, and then uh, the, their attitude changed quite dramatically. And then they became very negative about the progress of this uh, joint study of history. And so I had to visit the Beijing many times together with uh, Takahara-san. Then uh, after that, uh, they just uh, succeeded in holding, in holding uh, Olympic games. And then in, toward the end of that year, there was a Lehman shock and the China contributed greatly to, to the uh, overcoming of this uh, shock, then they became very uh, confident. 
up until then, I had uh, heard from many Chinese friends that uh, democracy, freedom is wonderful, but we need some more time in the future. But since then, after 2008, I seldom hear this kind of remarks from uh, Chinese people. Uh, that was a starting point. That means uh, uh, Fu Jintao's uh, slogan was a flexible society, a harm, harmless, uh, sorry, harmonious society, domestically and internationally. It disappeared and he lost his influence uh, toward the hawks. And then uh, Xi Jinping came to power toward the end of uh, 12, 2012, and he was formally became the leader next year, 2013. Since then, his idea is a great revival of Chinese people, a great revival of Chinese civilization. But look at the history. Uh, China has already revived uh, greatly. And then uh, they became number two in economic uh, size uh, in 2010, uh, surpassing Japan. Then uh, they became even more confident. And it was uh, formally uh, argued that uh, China has to make a great revival, though they have already revived. That means they are going to expand beyond their traditional uh, border. It was about at that time that uh, they began to expand their influence in South China Sea. Also, they started to invade into the uh, Senkaku area in Eastern China Sea. And to that, the Philippines brought this issue to the International Court of Arbitration as you may remember, in 2013. And then the, the court, International Court of Arbitration, decided that there's no ground for Chinese claim over nine dash line. But China responded, this is just a piece of paper. And then he, they decided just to neglect it at all. At about the same time, you know, a Chinese neighbor uh, one of the top Chinese naval admiral had a meeting with the uh, American counterpart as he said that the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean is big enough. Therefore, uh, you know, US take care of the Eastern part of Pacific Ocean and we are going to take care of the Western part of Pacific Ocean. Then where should Japan be located in this area? This shows their idea of international uh, relations. The, International order has to be, you know, uh, governed by power, not by law. And then also uh, that uh, international order is a kind of hierarchical one. You know, they distinguish the diplomacy with the big countries and the diplomacy with the neighboring countries. Japan is a little bit, uh, you know, ambiguous because Japan is big, but in the neighborhood. Therefore, they accept the kind of equality with the United States, with Russia, uh, probably with India and with EU, but not to the uh, neighboring countries. Uh, when a foreign minister appears in the meeting in ASEAN, uh, sometimes he shouts that you are small countries, we are big. And this is their attitude. Uh, I remember one meeting in a Davos conference in 2016, uh, in a very closed meeting, uh, the main speaker was the president of Ukraine. And then he told about the uh, hybrid warfare of Soviet Russia and then to the detail. And then many, most of the uh, participants are from European countries. And they said that this is not an issue for Ukraine alone. This is a serious issue for all European countries. I said, no. This is all serious issue for all the democratic countries. You know, because what China is, uh, what Russia is doing is terrible, but with uh, some, some cynical nuance, it is just within the former border of Soviet Russia. But China is expanding beyond that. I think that, uh, you know, international disputes have to be solved by uh, arbitration, diplomacy, negotiation, uh, or uh, anything like that, not by power. No solution of international disputes by power is the most important achievement human beings 
was established after World War II. But by bringing uh, some kind of uh, uh, powerful activities, short of war, is now being used by Russia and by uh, China. No less violent, apparently. Uh, just You can just look at the map and the Scarborough show, which is just off the coast of the uh, Philippines, and which was under the control of, most of it is under the control of China. And uh, recently they appeared, uh, they sent 200 shipping boats. Uh, Apparently, it's a big ship. Uh, then China, uh, sorry, Philippines could not do anything. Uh, we are appealing to the uh, the America, of course, since 1910s, but they didn't give us uh, any years. Then uh, it continued. Uh, the most of the uh, uh, islands in 9-I right, are already fortified. It's a very difficult situation. Uh, uh, Chinese uh, attitude is well known to the Japanese people. Actually, I was, uh, when I was a president, at, uh, I was a professor at the University of Tokyo. One student from uh, Uyghur was uh, detained, arrested in, uh, uh, when he came back to uh, Uyghur, he was arrested and sentenced to be in prison for uh, 12 years. Then, uh, uh, this uh, is, uh, you know, this takes place quite often. Uh, I'm coming to uh, nearly 10 minutes, but uh, I have to say uh, a few more things. But in uh, the, the relationship between the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, this is not a counter proposal against Belt and Road. Free and open Indo-Pacific is a precondition for Japan's uh, development after the war. And also Japan's economic development contributed to the development of those areas, also the, to the connect, connectivity of those Indo-Pacific area. Uh, therefore, uh, we have a long history before the declaration by Prime Minister Abe of uh, FOIP in 2016. Rather, a Chinese Belt and Road is a challenger to this. And then what we are seeing is a conflict between the two concepts about the international relations. We hope that we can maintain that uh, trade has to be done freely, and then international disputes have to be solved uh, peacefully, and then all the nations have to be treated equally. But to this Chinese challenge is a rather awful one. The economy is under control of politics. If you are not behaving friendly, then you cannot get the profit of a trade with China. And then uh, the uh, neighboring countries are treated uh, hierarchically. Then uh, the, uh, they can expand by power, which is a little bit short of war. Therefore, uh, the role of uh, uh, Europe is very important. Even the norm setting, of course, and also uh, you have to show that we are standing on a different value system. We cannot agree with your value system, but together with the, some sign of your determination. You know, some European countries are sending the fleets to Asia, which is certainly, which is not particularly big compared to Chinese military, but still, it is important to show your determination. Uh, as uh, someone told us, it's very difficult to make a decoupling, even now. Uh, even in Japan, the business community is uh, uh, very difficult to, to make a decoupling with the Chinese economy. Therefore, this is a very complex game we have to engage in. Uh, some kind of uh, kokom or chinkom, some type of new type of kokom or chinkom has to be established, but with, uh, which is a very difficult one. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, we have to have, uh, uh, you know, cooperation with the European friends very much. And then uh, at the same time, I have to say that Japan cannot take the, exactly the same position as the United States, because we are just neighbor to China. 
And if there's some emergency, it's too dangerous for us. The same can be said to Southeast Asian countries. So I think that the most important task is uh, how to help those Southeast Asian countries and then how, uh, you know, engage with them uh, so that they will not go to the hands of China. I stop here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much indeed, President Kitaoka. Uh, you have uh, uh, reviewed the uh, recent history of the ascent China, uh, as well as the, uh, the measures and issues surrounding uh, that, uh, the uh, measures to run counter to that, uh, the, the, the China uh, from US, Japan, and, and others, uh, as well as the, uh, the revolving issues surrounding that uh, uh, the trend. Now, um, for the sake of time, may I shift uh, to the final speaker, uh, Madam, uh, 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 sorry, Dr. Costa. Uh, she is the uh, 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 diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Italy, and formerly a scholar uh, specialized in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so, uh, Anna, could you um, take the floor, please? Yes, um, can you hear me? Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, talk briefly today about the Italian and EU engagement with the Indo-Pacific, um, focusing on avenues for cooperation with Japan. And first of all, let me thank the, the organizers and fellow panelists. Um, in the last few years, Italy has pursued a policy of expanding and consolidating its position in the Indo-Pacific macro region in light of the area's growing centrality uh, at both the economic and geopolitical levels. Rome perceives the stability and development of the Indo-Pacific as crucial to both global stability and prosperity and to its own economic growth. Japan, China, South Korea, and ASEAN countries, amongst others, already represent a key destination for Italian experts and investment. Other bilateral economic and trade relations, such as that with India, have a large growth potential. According to the ADB, China will, uh, Asia will double its share of global GDP to 52% by 2050, regaining a position of economic dominance. While harboring exceptional opportunities for its own population and the outside world, the macro region faces a series of traditional and non-traditional security challenges, <clears throat> including heightened geopolitical tensions deriving from a shift in the balance of power, several maritime and territorial disputes, piracy, illegal migration, natural disasters, climate change, epidemics, and now, of course, a pandemic. This vulnerability not only threatens regional human development, but also puts the smooth flow of trade and energy security supplies at risk with potentially dire consequences for Europe as well. As, <clears throat> as the Asian component of the Indo-Pacific increasingly becomes the center of gravity of economic growth um, in the 21st century, um, our European partners, both EU and non-EU, and EU institutions are also paying increasing attention to the region's opportunities and challenges. In time, the EU has increasingly moved beyond its traditional development-based approach to the region towards the adoption of a three-pronged approach based on strengthening political, political partnerships with regional actors, promoting shared rules and standards, as well as trade and economic exchange through through an expanding architecture of free trade and economic partnership agreements, reinforcing its contribution to regional security. Germany, France, and the Netherlands have recently published their own national strategic guidelines for projection in the region, nesting them in a broader EU framework, whose guidelines are presently under discussion amongst EU institutions and member states. For its part, Italy actively supports the birth of a strategic EU approach to the Indo-Pacific aimed at stepping up EU presence and exploring cooperation opportunities, both bilateral, multilateral and multi-bilateral with countries in the macro region. Japan figures prominently, prominently amongst them as a partner owing to a commonality of views about the values, principles and standards that should underpin regional development. This emerged clearly during the EU Foreign Affairs Council held on 25 January this year between the foreign ministers of the EU member states and Motegi Toshimitsu, the uh, foreign minister of Japan. 
The nascent EU strategic approach is based on the promotion of a green recovery, a stable, open, fair, free and fair environment for trade and investment, environmental and social sustainability, human rights, resilience, the peaceful resolution of disputes, secure maritime supply routes and chains, high quality, sustainable and rural space connectivity, the advancement of effective multilateralism, also through greater engagement with ASEAN and other regional organizations and fora, the defense of the rules-based international order. The nascent EU strategic approach to the Indo-Pacific builds upon the EU global strategy issued in 2016 and the EU uh, European Council conclusions from May 2018 on enhancing EU security cooperation in and with Asia, which underpin the EU commitment to scale up security engagement in and with Asia to complement its economic reach. This effort reflects the EU and its member states' key interest in the peace and security of the macro region and in the openness of sea lanes of communication that are vital for the smooth functioning of international trade. The EU approach also builds upon the, the EU strategy for connectivity between Europe and Asia presented to the European Parliament in September 2018. The focus of Italy's diplomatic action towards the Indo-Pacific has been on deepening bilateral relations with regional countries and achieving membership to the main regional bodies, of which Japan is also a partner or member. In 2019, Rome became dialogue partner of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IORA, promoting cooperation on a variety of issues ranging from the blue economy to women's economic empowerment. The fact that Japan is also an IORA partner offers opportunities for common projects and Italy-Japan collaborations in IORA countries. To this end, contacts are ongoing between Italian and Japanese IORA national focal points. At the end of 2020, Italy became a development partner of ASEAN, a result attained on the back of several years of fruitful, fruitful cooperation in training and capacity building activities in favor of ASEAN countries in the field of domestic security, anti-terrorism, cyber threats, organized crime, where Italy is perceived as a competent and important partner. These activities were co-organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Interior. ASEAN centrality and upholding the multilateral rules-based uh, rules international order are also key Japanese interests, as most recently stated in the Quad Summit joint communique issued by Japan, the US, Australia and India on 12 March. Since, 20, um, since 2007, Italy has joined the EU in becoming a dialogue partner of the Pacific Islands Forum, which regrettably at the moment is undergoing a bit of a crisis. We attach great importance to this partnership, which allows us to play a role uh, and contribute to regional climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. Um, Japan, of course, is a founding dialogue partner of the organization, and there is a certain overlapping of common areas of strategic interest with the um, Pacific Islands Forum for Italy and Japan, including at the level of environmental protection, um, marine protected areas and a sustainable climate change, ocean-based economy and disaster risk re reduction. Italy and Japan are also both members of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, a partnership uh, um, that promotes resilience uh, of infrastructure systems to climate change and disaster risks. Last week, Prime Minister Draghi himself intervened as a keynote speaker at the International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Italy is interested in exploring with Japan possibilities for multilateral cooperation in third countries in the macro region in areas ranging from illegal migration and anti-piracy to humanitarian disaster relief through capacity building activities. Increased cooperation with Japan, both in Asia and in Africa, also in Europe, could build on the positive experiences already accumulated, for instance, through anti-piracy, joint training and operational activities in the Gulf of Aden involving Japan's maritime self-defense forces, the Italian Navy and the EU Atalanta mission. As indicated by for former um, Prime Minister Conte to then Prime Minister Abe, during their meeting in Rome in April 2019, uh, and as restated by Foreign Minister Luigi Di Maio to his Japanese counterpart, Otegi Toshimitsu, during the EU Foreign Affairs Council on 25 January this year, Italy is interested in Japan's vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific based on shared principles and values, like the rule of law, freedom of navigation, and the development of high quality and sustainable infrastructure. 
Strong support for regional cooperation was also expressed by Prime Minister Mario Draghi to Prime Minister Suga Yoshihide during their phone call last Friday, 19 March. Italy, the EU and Japan share a common stake in the prosperity, stability, security and openness of the Indo-Pacific region. Dealing with the magnitude of economic opportunities as well as security challenges involved requires us to engage in effective international coordination and cooperation. This is true also in relation to urgent non-traditional security challenges from global health to climate change and cybersecurity. Italy is ready to explore concrete avenues of cooperation with Japan in line with the EU-Japan partnership for sustainable collectivity and quality infrastructure established in 2019 uh, with the Western Balkans, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Indo-Pacific and Africa as priority areas, leveraging EU-Japan instruments such as the Economic Partnership Agreement and the, the Strategic Partnership Agreement. We take an inclusive but principled approach to connectivity between Europe and Asia in the belief that all existing initiatives can complement each other. Environmental, social, fiscal sustainability is at the core of the Italian and Japanese approaches to connectivity. With regards to the, to the environment in particular, Japan supports the goals of Italy's current G G20 presidents, presidency and whose program is actually in continuity with the Japan's presidency of 2019. And also Italy's co-presidency of the COP26 so for promoting a green recovery and developing the circular economy. Also in close cooperation with the COP15 on biodiversity hosted in, by China and Kunmin. The FOI geographical scope meets Italian interests in Asia, in Asia and Africa. We are interested in developing collaborations and ex exploring synergies with Japan, both through the facilitation of private sector partnerships between Italian and Japanese enterprises and through development aid initiatives. Another important area of collaboration, both in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond, between Italy, the EU and Japan, one of our G7 partners, is the fight against the pandemic. Both the Italian, EU and Japanese approaches are based on multilateralism, inclusiveness, inclusiveness and a transparent set of rules and standards as demonstrated by the common participation in the COVAX facility for the provision of vaccines and a cure to countries in need. Prime Minister Draghi uh, recently renewed his invitation to Prime Minister Suga to personally attend the G20 Global Health Summit to be held in Rome on, 21st, on the 21st of May. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, uh, for, the, uh, for letting us uh, aware of this uh, Italian and perhaps uh, pan-European strategy to uh, Indo-Pacific and the, the beyond. Now, um, we are somehow lacking behind, but still uh, have plenty of time to discuss. And I'd like to uh, encourage you panelists uh, to, to discuss among yourself uh, but the, uh, uh, I should perhaps uh, put in order uh, some themes. Now, uh, since this is this sort of uh, the, uh, the launching session of the launching event, so uh, may I um, uh, suggest to discuss a little bit of the uh, mega theme. Um, uh, the uh, Natalie's talk touched upon the, uh, the regime competition. Uh, this is a sort of um, uh, important aspect of today's world politics, uh, in my view, uh, because uh, he's, you know, in a sense, this is a historical moment that since uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, perhaps we are again entering into the uh, era of the uh, regime differences and regime competition. Uh, perhaps not as gigantic as the Nazi challenges and, you know, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, we still have this, uh, you know, the, the issue of regime differences and then uh, the, uh, the competition uh, of the different visions of the, uh, of the, of the world. Now, um, I wonder the, um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, according to you, the um, what is your assessment of the um, uh, this aspect of historical transformation? 
Um, obviously, China is not Soviet Union. We have a deep economic interdependence with each other, and the uh, the uh, uh, you know the uh, Chinese ideology is not that the hard, perhaps. Uh, 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 hard, you know, hard as the uh, uh, perhaps the communist uh, manifesto uh, uh, a la Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, we have differences, but still this, uh, you know, regime competition and struggle for this superiority uh, are uh, getting more into the you know, central part of this uh, today's world politics. World politics. So uh, I just wonder, the Natalie suggested that the, uh, this might be even more acute. Uh, this competition is, might be more acute. Um, so um, uh, if, if, you, if some of you uh, may have uh, a, anything to expand uh, or run counter uh, you know, to this point, uh, I would welcome. Natalie, would you like to expand your, your point? Yeah, just perhaps a couple of points in addition. Um, I mean, I would say the following, really. I mean, it's it's clear. I mean, if we if we make the comparison, as I said, with uh, with the past, and in particular with the Cold War past, uh, we I think we are in a situation in which, on the one hand, um, there is. Uh, sort of greater risk embedded in the current situation because there are a far greater number of areas in which conflict plays out. I mean, this is, you know, the Cold War was at the end of the day a sort of almost monodimensional confrontation in the nuclear sphere. Uh, as I said, I think politically, and, and in governance terms, the argument was won in a sense fairly early on. Uh, and of course, this is the sort of, you know, went hand in hand with the economics. As I said, there was a military dimension, a nuclear dimension, which was extremely uh, dangerous, of course, I mean, existentially dangerous, um, but it was confined to that one area. Whereas now we're in a situation in which conflict plays out on many more areas. Uh, which increases inevitably the complexity of the current confrontation. At the same time, and this is the flip side of the coin, Ken, you, you um, hinted at this, um, there is far greater interdependence today than there was back then. And again, depending on where one comes from, in a sense, in terms of uh, one's politics or, uh, or, or political philosophy, if you like, but if one believes that interdependence is perhaps not a guarantee of peace, but it is uh, an element that mitigates conflict, then interdependence, the, the, the degree of interdependence uh, of China with um, uh, liberal democracies contains uh, the, the risk of, of confrontation. So, you know, I, I think there are sort of pluses and minuses on both sides, but the, the, the broader political and ideological confrontation, I think is, more acute, not because it's more dangerous, because I obviously completely agree with you, you know, there is, uh, we, we can't exactly compare this to the danger posed by political ideologies in, uh, in the 20th century, um, but it's more acute in the sense that it's, it will be, and I think it already is, harder to win the argument. Uh, because if at the end of the day, uh, the argument is won by that system that uh, increases uh, prosperity to its citizens and at the same time reduces inequalities amongst its citizens, well, the jury is out. And, uh, and, and, and I don't mean by this that there is a risk that therefore we will end up having the same authoritarian system a la Chinese. I don't think that will happen. Um, but I do think that in the broader normative competition and contestation worldwide, uh, where there are countries that are not wed, in a sense, to either one way or the other, it will be a harder argument to win. Um, Professor Kitaoka, you have uh, singled out uh, the 2008 as a sort of watershed of history. Perhaps uh, it might fit uh, into this sort of picture of regime competition. That year is a sort of uh, signal, you know, signature year, perhaps. 
would you like to yeah. respond, please? Yeah. That was the starting point of the, the new policy uh, under the influence of CTP. But uh, yeah, I quite agree with uh, Natalie on this point. This is a kind of regime competition. But it's not an ideological competition alone, because you know, you know, in diplomacy, you have to your diplomacy is based on your idea of regime. And then this is more difficult than before because you know because of you know economic uh, interdependence. Uh, take for example the African countries or many developing countries, they have been accepting many uh, support from China, masks, uh, protection uh, clothes, and then now vaccines nowadays, and also uh, uh, they are accepting a lot of money to invest some infrastructure, and then they can manage manipulate the economic uh, transaction as they can do. For example, uh, when uh, uh, the Philippines, they, China found a Philippine defiant, then they can stop, they can slow down the process of importing bananas from Philippines. Then bananas are rotten. And then recently, uh, China just stopped the import of uh, pineapple from Taiwan. Then they can just manage and then uh, that is uh, not possible from the liberal countries. Uh, therefore, uh, there's a good possibility that China may dominate the uh, most of the developing countries to their side. Uh, and then even from uh, our, our side, uh, Western uh, democratic countries in Europe and Japan, is it really possible that um, we, we refrain from exporting the highly sensitive goods while we can enjoy the trade of uh, automobiles and other goods. Uh, uh, do you think that they allow that? You know, they have a purchase power. And therefore, uh, it's a very difficult uh, to handle. Uh, the military confrontation is not likely to take place immediately because China is a relatively cautious country. Therefore, China's waiting for other countries to uh, make compromise. Uh, in any sense, this is a very diff difficult situation. A regime, certainly regime, what, this is what I, I said. They, they, they have a different idea of international relations uh, on their own. And then, uh, uh, then they will treat one country after another. Take, for example, the ASEAN countries. Among ASEAN countries, Cambodia is uh, almost accepting anything from China. And then Laos is uh, are quite obedient. And then now there's a kind of split from uh, among the ASEAN countries. And then that's why I said that, uh, you know, keeping ASEAN countries on our side is very important. Uh, but we should not ask them to choose US or China. Then they will not support any, any initiative of this kind. Therefore, we have to engage with them on a, a not a very tight rule. Uh, but uh, so that they should not go into the Chinese camp. I'm not, uh, Japan is not trying to compete influence over Southeast Asian countries, but we are trying to support their independence and solidarity and the like. Uh, therefore, this is a very complicated uh, strategy needed here. So I think this is a very difficult one. Such a big country like uh, China cannot be influenced from outside very much. Uh, the change has to be started from inside. And then in that political structure, you know, no one can tell Xi Jinping the truth about say Weibo or about Hong Kong or about Taiwan. And then, because it's dangerous. If you say something which he does not like, then you, you are, your future will be in danger. Therefore, in that sense, I think the conversation between the top leaders is very important. You know, even Abe Shinzo, uh, Prime Minister Abe could say something straight to Xi Jinping while he was trying to maintain a kind of friendly relationship. But uh, meanwhile, he was uh, differing to the situation in uh, Hong Kong and Uyghur. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to let Xi Jinping know about the real public opinion outside China. 
Thank you. I uh, just um, uh, wonder the um, you know the just following this uh, Professor Kitaoka's uh, comment, the uh, Natalie talked about this interdependence bringing about the sort of mitigation of conflicts, but this type of thesis might have been a sort of. Um, um, sort of uh, uh, varied only during the, uh, you know, benign U.S. hegemony, perhaps, uh, and uh, we uh, we can that we cannot assume anymore. And this interdependence is sometimes used as a weapon, you know, just as Professor Kitaoka mentioned, you know, you name, uh, you know, Australian beef or, you know, pi Taiwanese pineapple. And we, we ourselves were hit uh, uh, in 2010 uh, when the drunken uh, captain hit the public vessels of Japan's Coast Guard. And then, uh, you know, the uh, rare metal exportation was virtually stopped. Now, um, I think uh, this interdependence is uh, even more difficult to manage these days uh, because of this uh, regime competition, because of this, uh, you know, interdependence itself. Um, uh, so th that, that is why we have this uh, agony of RCEP and CAI, perhaps. Uh, Reihard, would you have any, any comment on this side? Well, certainly I do agree that um, interdependence is being weaponized uh, presently. Uh, we see that, as you said, uh, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, Australia. We also see it in the case of Sweden. We saw it in the case of the Czech Republic. Uh, we see it all around. And I think there is no ambiguity left about China's goal of reshaping the international order in its own way and, and making it safe uh, for autocracy. Um, the, uh, I, I completely agree with what uh, Professor Kitaoka said about uh, uh, the, the phrase of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, not being about uh, the Chinese nation, but being about the role of the Chinese nation vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, being a program for an expansion uh, of uh, the, the leverage um, of China. And I believe the, the core lesson that Europe has not, still not learned fully is uh, that, as uh, Mrs. Tochi said, we're not living in a world anymore that is in line with our own ideals. So, so Europe used to, to find itself well at ease in a world um, of uh, um, rules-based order, but uh, this is not the world we're living in, and we cannot just operate on the basis of the assumption that um, uh, what we experience presently is just a, a short-term deviation uh, of that order. There has been a fundamental transformation, and uh, that uh, poses, uh, I would say, new, new questions uh, uh, to all of us. And, and that is being uh, complicated by the growing number of global challenges that uh, would need uh, a comprehensive cooperation with all kinds of uh, um, different partners, including China. We, we have the old uh, issues about around poverty alleviation and global justice, the old issues of disarmament, but in addition, uh, we have uh, now a, a growing migration issue, we have pandemics and we have overall climate change. And uh, this uh, is, um, can be seen as a, a, a temptation sometimes to compartmentalize our China policy uh, by uh, sort of restricting uh, the uh, systemic rivalry to just a, a certain, uh, number of issues while trying to to uh, uh, pursue a win-win approach with regard to others like climate change. I don't think that works. Uh, I think uh, the systemic rivalry uh, that we um, have with China uh, is pervasive and 
it doesn't prevent us from cooperating at times uh, and as, as best we can, but you, it, cooperating as a systemic rival is different from cooperating under the assumption that uh, the, the basic relationship is uh, harmonious. Uh, and, and therefore, I think uh, we, we have to change uh, the, the awareness. Get, we have to get our house in order, obviously. Um, we're, we're not the, uh, at the moment, uh, we're not the city upon the hill, the shining city upon the hill that everybody looks up to. Uh, that, that's certainly one of our weaknesses. But we also have to, to change the, uh, our own perception of the challenges. And I believe that it is of ultimate uh, relevancy. And again, I would want to support what the Professor Kitaoka said, that we look at third nations. We don't just look at the triangle between the US, Europe, and China. We have to look at third nations because the argument will be one over who provides the greatest happiness to the greatest number, not on a national scale, but on a global scale. Powerful argument. Uh, we, uh, before uh, you know, coming back to the speakers, I just would like to uh, um, urge the viewers of this session to raise questions I, as you feel important uh, through the YouTube, uh, you know, the um, uh, part. But, uh, so far, there's no question posed yet. So please feel free to raise any questions and then uh, we will look at that. Now, um, uh, so this is a sort of uh, perhaps the heart of the problem uh, that the uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, um, you know the um, if we can le we can sort of uh, decouple in a different sense decouple between the uh, economic and trade you know you know technological advancement uh, and the politics and security uh, but these are these two are so overlapped uh, and uh, you know uh, it's so intertwined. Uh, that the uh, we cannot just uh, the uh, leave the interdependence untouched by the politics and security. Now, um, uh, the um, so far I may be wrong, so I just would like to have the response from two Italian ladies. The uh, the uh, you know when Natalie described the uh, uh, the need. Uh, for the sort of, uh, this is in my term, loose multilateralism uh, as against, as opposed to the tight, tight multilateralism, uh, sort of hard and soft, uh, you know, type of cooperations. Uh, and, and when the uh, Dr. Costa uh, uh, described the, uh, you know, sort of um, mm, the, the list of uh, cooperative forums and the uh, memberships uh, and so on uh, in the cooperative spirits with Japan and other uh, Asian Pacific na uh, nations. Um, I just wonder if it, when uh, it comes to contradictory, you know, the between uh, this sort of loose type of multilateralism, tight multilateralism, or, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, cooperative forums with Japan, with Asia Pacific, with China, you know, if they are contradictory and the not really complementary, uh, that is a sort of uh, moment that we would be tested. Um, so uh, I, I, am I clear? I just wonder, the, uh, you know, the uh, in overlapped, you know, interests are fine. But sometimes, uh, you know, the, uh, these are uh, under question, and sometimes we are pushed by the, you know, the United States not to, uh, uh, not to be, you know, uh, into the, in, not to go into this uh, cooperative, complementary, you know, supplementary overlapped interest field. Uh, so I just, just wonder, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know. Uh, th th this is a dilemma for every nation, but if you have any response. 
not uh Chitaoka sensei please if you go first please thank you endo san what i i'd like to say is that um, you know the we have to discuss not only the policy towards china policy among the uh, democracies but also our policy to the developing countries is also very important you know how to uh, keep them on our side, supporting democratization, supporting uh, stability, supporting their economic development. Therefore, uh, that's why I'm uh, being a uh, president of JICA and trying to engage with them. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we have started the program of uh, building more than 100 hospitals in developing countries uh, to help those people uh, from pandemic. And then uh, uh, this is important, I think, uh, uh, that's why I was saying that how to engage with the ASEAN countries on our side. Otherwise, China will collect as many supporters as possible on their side. So uh, we have to prevent China from dominating international community. Then one more thing I'd like to add is that, uh, you know, because I see many, uh, the, I see the presence of uh, uh, Italy uh, as well as uh, Germany, and then I was an uh, ambassador to the United Nations uh, from 2004 and 2006. And then the core, the most important issue was the Security Council reform. Unfortunately, we are on the other side. Italy and Japan competed each other and they, Japan was holding the idea of Model A, uh, trying to make ourselves, uh, Japan, Germany, Brazil, India, and some African countries, uh, permanent member countries. And while uh, Italy was against that, uh, they are uh, rather sympathetic toward the Model B in which no permanent seat is to be created, but uh, let's create uh, non, uh, the semi-permanent seat. This is a core of Model uh, B. Now, after the failure of uh, uh, 2005 effort, I think uh, both of those countries should get together and restart with the idea of Model B, which allows uh, many important countries to be on the Security Council on non-permanent basis, but much longer than today. And then on this issue, uh, Japan, Germany, Italy, uh, those countries can cooperate. And then uh, so that uh, more democracies may be able to have more voice in Security Council. So that the new approach to Security Council is uh, another way. And together with the, uh, what I said, the cooperation uh, for uh, the ODA, and uh, which was impossible under Trump administration. We talked to them uh, quite a lot, but Trump didn't want to pay any penny to uh, uh, developing countries. Now, I hope the situation will be changed in new administration. Thank you. Great, Professor Kitaoka. Uh, thank you very much for your touching upon the uh, another important aspect of this uh, politics of attractiveness. Natalie also talked about this difficulty of this uh, new regime competition because it, up, you know, the Chinese model appeals perhaps to others. Uh, Natalie, sorry to make you wait. Would you like to say? Yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of come back to, to, to the point that you were raising about, you know, the United States and, 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 and Europe and Japan and, and, you know, sort of do, do, where, where do we stand in all of this? And, and I think it's important. And I think I, I can say this also for, for, for Japan, certainly for Europe. But I think it's important to recognize that when it comes to China, Although uh, as, as Europeans and, and Americans and as Japanese, we're broadly speaking uh, on the same page, we do have slightly different uh, goals. And I think it's important to recognize this uh, and to talk about it very openly. And, and let me put it in these terms. Um, let us imagine for the sake of argument that China was a shining liberal democracy. Uh, but it was rising and it had risen and it was overtaking the United States. Uh, would the United States have a problem with it? Yes, it would. So for the United States, it's a story about rivalry. It's a story about, in a sense, global hegemony. 
would Europeans or, or, the, or, or, or Japan have a problem with a risen China that had overtaken the United States but was a shining liberal democracy? You, if, if I can speak for Europeans, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let <laughs> others speak for Japan, we wouldn't have a problem. I mean, we, it, our problem has intrinsically got to do with the nature of China and the way and, and its governance model. And in a sense, it's a far more existential threat to us than it is to the United States. Huh? Because what we fear is China impinging upon our internal norms and, and rules and, and laws. Because of what Reinhard was mentioning, you know, the weaponization uh, of interdependence. So I think the predicament that we're in is one in which we say, well, hey, we think in, in general interdependence is a good thing. So we don't want to go all the way down the sort of decoupling route. But we realize that dependence or asymmetric interdependence has its risks. In fact, it even has its threats because it is being weaponized. So this makes us say, well, we want to sort of establish and reinforce our autonomy. Okay, fine. But it's a very um, thin line between reinforcing your autonomy without falling into the trap of closure or protectionism. Because if we were to go all the way down into that trap, then we would be working against those very norms and rules that we've been uh, promoting. So I think it's important to recognize that this is the predicament, it's a very complex predicament that we're in, but this is where we're at. And I think if, if, if I may, it is a similar one that Japan is in. Thank you, thank you. Um, does, would Anna has, any yes. reaction, please? I, uh, you know, I, I was maybe I was not that clear, but I was referring to the you, the, the list of your you know collaborative uh, forums. Uh, uh, but you also have the same set of uh, collaborative collaborative forums with China as well. So I just just wondered how to you know the uh, think about these relations. Thank you. Yes. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that I really agree with Natalie. I think she hit the nail on the head. Um, as far as the difference between the US and Europe um, is with regards to, to China. I mean, the, 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 the systemic rivalry part of the European tripartite approach to, to China is still different from the kind of rivalry um, across the board um, that, that, that is ongoing between the US and, and China. Having said that, of course, we, we do welcome the sort of change in approach of the current Biden administration, which is, as, um, as uh, many of you were mentioning, is much more open, um, much more open to, to uh, strengthening alliances and sort of uh, strengthening dialogue with partners uh, when it comes to um, China. And uh, we are, in, in Italy, in the European Union, we're always very careful to stress, stress both challenges and opportunities, because for us, um, uh, continuing to engage China, especially when it comes to global challenges, is absolutely crucial. So, uh, for example, we welcome its particip participation in the global, um, in the COVAX facility um, against the pandemic, and we also welcome its um, um, aim to achieve uh, um, carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, in terms of um, what you were mentioning, that uh, our participation in a, in a vast array of, of fora um, and organizations in the Indo-Pacific, that is true, and it goes in line with the inclusive approach that we that we have um, concerning connectivity, based on the um, also on the ongoing dialogue on on connectivity between between China and the EU and on, um, on very, very clear principles of uh, sustainability and uh, shared rules. All right, thank you for your clarification. Uh, Reinhardt, please, you're raising hand, please go ahead. I, I do agree both with uh, Natalie and Anna about the difference between uh, the European uh, relationship to China and the US relationship to China. But uh, from my point of view, the, the 
the most fundamental issue is, as Natalie said, the uh, systemic rivalry where um, we cannot sustain our own liberal orders if we allow China to uh, manipulate international rules and uh, to uh, uh, influence, um, as they're trying to do, uh, the way in which we um, pursue our own affairs. Uh, so I think on this very basis, on the basis of the congruency between the US and Europe with regard to systemic rivalry, we are obliged to form a camp vis-a-vis -vis China. On the other hand, this cannot be a closed camp. As uh, Professor Kitaoka has emphasized several times, it has to be a wide camp that is open for collaboration of many other countries. And within this camp, there is a particular relationship to be developed between non-hegemonic powers or non-hegemonic players of the uh, multilateral order uh, to rein in the hegemonic competition uh, and, and to try avoiding a situation where the hegemonic competition overwhelms everything. But this is on the basis of being in the same camp. All right. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, does anybody to respond to any of the points? Um, the, um, if not, the uh, Natalie, uh, um, you are still advisor to the uh, high representative of the foreign affairs of the European Union, um, uh, uh, and, and I just overheard that the uh, you know the there would be EU's vision on the in the Pacific uh, region. Uh, so the, uh, I just uh, you know uh, heard your. Um, Sort of uh, uh, vision, two visions of uh, two cooperative vision of multilateralism. But the, uh, uh, how would you imagine, or maybe you are advising already the um, the the shape of this uh, new EU Indo-Pacific uh, vision? Um, if you can talk uh, now, <laughs> I just. Well, I, 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 I'll just uh, perhaps limit myself to, to this. Um, you know, in general, sort of um, strategies, sub strategies, plans, communications when it comes to, uh, to the European Union tend to have a sort of double purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, the first and obvious one, which is why other countries do the same, is uh, an exercise of external communication. You want to tell the world what is it that you're about, what is it that you want to do. When it comes to the European Union, as if not even more important, is an internal dimension of uh, consensus building, of narrative building. And I think this is particularly true when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. I mean, I think here, we're facing a situation in which this is a notion that has now, uh, I would say, percolated quite deeply amongst some member states, uh, France, Germany, to mention two obvious ones. I think it is beginning to make headway in others, and, and Matt spoke about this in the Italian context, uh, where I think it is still more embryonic, but the seeds are there. It is entirely absent in many other member states. So to me, it would be a success if the purpose of this uh, uh, EU level work is that of basically putting this notion uh, amongst a, a sort of shared basis uh, uh, amongst, amongst the 27 member states, because this is inevitably the first step for any action. The action, I mean, you know, don't hold your breath for immediate action at EU level. I don't think that this is where we're at. I don't think this is what it's about. I think what it's about now is actually putting the Indo-Pacific in our sort of international politics map and doing so on a shared basis amongst 27 member states. The Dr. Costa, would you like to add something on it? You're going to chair the G20 meeting, right? 
the uh, in the next uh, few months. Uh, uh, yes. Right. I just just wonder if you have any visions to lead uh, during that presidency. Uh, if we have any, can you repeat so the, the so the vision uh, to lead? Uh, you know that the um, oh yeah. Um, uh, the president Letta uh, was talking about the, the importance of this G20. And the, um, do you have any agenda, specific agenda? Yes, the, the Italian program is based on prosperity, planet, and people. And so it's about the promotion of a green, inclusive recovery, especially now that we are trying to uh, put our effort um, to get, um, trying to collaborate internationally to overcome the pandemic and, um, and sort of restart the engines of the global economy. In order to do that, of course, we need all of the major economies on board. And therefore China is a, is a crucial part of, the, of this effort um, together, mm -hmm. of course, the US, Japan and Europe and, and many other countries. Um, so, it, and, but it's about making this recovery green and, um, uh, and sustainable. And, um, and it's about promoting health, which is why I, I mentioned the Global mm -hmm. Health Summit in Rome in May. And, uh, and of course, there are um, and, it, and it's people is one of the core components of our program because we uh, going back to what going back to what um, President Letta was was talking about when he said like a kind of technological humanism. We we agree that um, that the development and the use of the use of technology is crucial, but we must make it a use of technology that benefits um, people in the first place. So. Um, of course, there's also women empowerment and um, and and many other sort of uh, detailed aspects of the presidency, which I'm not going to talk about um, um, right now. But um, this is kind of the, the overall vision. And um, Japan, of course, is also one of the main partners, as I said, because we see the G20 presidency of Italy this year in continuity with the program of the Japanese presidency um, in 2019. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I think we shouldn't uh, perhaps underestimate the uh, still overlapped fields of interest, uh, you know, covering many parts of the, uh, uh, the countries. Now, uh, the, um, there is one question uh, at the uh, uh, YouTube, uh, um, and the, this is to Professor Kitaoka. Um, if I may read out, uh, if HOIP, uh, the free and open in the Pacific is not alternative and competitive with the Belt and Road Initiative, is there uh, still room for Sino-Japanese cooperation on specific issues like climate and infrastructure? Thank you. That is the, uh, from Mr. Marco Zappa. Uh, if I may <laughs> add on it, the, this uh, vision of HOIP not, uh, you know, the uh, posing the counter uh, vision to Belt and Road Initiative is, is the sort of thesis that you wrote uh, in the uh, GAIKO, I think, the, um, in another media uh, two years ago. So, but since then, the uh, you know these uh, recent uh, meetings of Quad, for instance, um, has shown the uh, the aspect of this competitive, more you know, rivalry part of uh, the aspects. So uh, if you if you can um, the um, answer to this question uh, uh, in view of this recent tightening of this uh, uh, quad, um, uh, I, would, I would appreciate. Uh, thank you. I think uh, the uh, FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, consists of several elements. One important element is the uh, US-Japan Security Alliance. Without the US-Japan Security Alliance and then the military bases in Japan, US cannot move around this area. And then also uh, the quad is one of the elements, but um, it's uh, not easy to bring uh, India 
into a deeper cooperation. They are very much a self-reliant country. And also, if we stress quad very much, then uh, ASEAN countries will not join, join to this one. So that all these things are necessary. Therefore, my idea about uh, cooperation with China will be uh, possible in Africa, for example, uh, or in uh, possibly in uh, Central Asia, but uh, uh, in I do not support any cooperation in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the time is limited, therefore, uh, can I add one or two more points from me, taking advantage of this occasion, Endo-san? Okay, please be, be, I think be, be, be I, brief, please, go ahead. Okay. It's very difficult to solve the issue, or, but we have to maintain the status quo without getting into the, the real uh, confrontation. Uh, the, it's in a sense a kind of a new type of containment, I think. Uh, as I have been saying that it's very difficult to influence China from outside. But China also faces a lot of difficulty domestically and also internationally. China is surrounded by many unfriendly countries. And also the biggest issue will be the aging. The China is uh, becoming as an aging society very quickly uh, without becoming really rich. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to endure this kind of a difficult containment system with some partial cooperation for 10 years or 20 years, uh, waiting for the change from within. That's my idea. And no sense, I, I, I'm yes. afraid I will have to leave, leave. now in okay. a minute. Yeah. Would you like to say any final word? Thank you. Oh, OK. Right. <laughs> OK. You have to leave. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I enjoyed uh, this conversation very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish you a good continuation. But my time is up now. Yes, uh, our time is also up. But you can leave. Please go okay. ahead. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I think we still have perhaps two, three mi more minutes. Uh, I, if I, I can abuse the power of chair. Now, the um, we have uh, in this session we have um, somewhat uh, recognized the difficulty of this uh, regime competition. You know the uh, uh, you know the. Um, uh, the, uh, you never know, uh, you know, which side wins and, and so on. So uh, precisely because of that, the importance of putting our house in order and the uh, maintaining the right set of attractive policies toward the South countries uh, is quite important. I think the uh, EU's vision toward the Indo-Pacific, our vision to Indo-Pacific, and then perhaps cooperative forums like G20, uh, all of us, the channels and the opportunities to, to precisely do that. Um, uh, I, otherwise, I, I think we still have the difficulties uh, in uh, you know, sort of managing the overlapping field of this uh, eco, eco -techno technology, you know, uh, economic statecraft field, uh, you know, uh, because of the you know, size of the uh, huge size of the Chinese economy. Now, um, uh, I think uh, the, we are somewhat running out of time, but some of you may have the final words in one minute or so. I would like to uh, offer the opportunity. So starting from uh, Madam Totti, would you like to say something for the final words? It, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Kitaoka sensei you have just uh, spelled out your, the, the vision at the final. You still have so, one more? So sorry to have made uh, kind of just one minute uh, or 30 seconds. The real issue is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Taiwan is the, the most serious issue. Mm -hmm. Over there, 23 million people are living safely, establishing their politics, government. And then what kind of attitude we are going to take is a, is a real test for us. 
Well, thank you for uh, raising that important issue. We are going to deal with Taiwan in another session, but uh, I, in fact, I was about to raise that uh, because that is a sort of uh, issue and theme that would uh, stretch our, you know, sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, benign, you know, uh, interest type of uh, overlapping politics, but uh, um, uh, beyond the uh, Winter Olympic in Beijing and beyond the extension of uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's tenure, uh, I think the Taiwan will be the issue that would, you know, test us. Now, um, Dr. Costa, would you like to say any final words? Um, well, I would like to thank you all. I, I, it was very interesting for me to join this panel. And um, regarding Taiwan, of course, we, we all monitor the situation very carefully. And um, the, the position is, of course, one of defending um, um, peaceful uh, relations across the strait. But um, yes, um, it's, it's one of the big security challenges ahead. Indeed. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, close the session. Uh, the, this is one of the many sessions to come. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I would like to uh, uh, warmly congratulate all of the speakers uh, who made a significant uh, contributions to our conference. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your precious time. Bye.